On this day in 1960, the F.W. Woolworth lunch counter was desegregated following a six month long protest in Greensboro, North Carolina. It's also been seven years since Black Lives Matter was founded in response to the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murder. I'm Doma T. Pongo, and over the next few weeks, we'll be drawing parallels between these significant moments in history and what we see happening on the streets today. History can give us the context to better understand what we're living through today. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak to one of our country's leading historians about how understanding our history can help us to move forward. I'll be in conversation with Lonnie Bunch, who's the first African-American Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution and the founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. And we'll chat about the roles of music, marches, media, memory, and social justice movements. First of all, uh, Secretary, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Uh, tell me what happened at the Woolworth County. Suddenly, college kids felt I can participate in the civil rights movement by simply sitting down. Four college students from North Carolina A&T decided they had to do something. One of their friends had been mistreated um, at a lunch counter in Richmond. And when he came back to college, they said, we've got to do something. They thought, let's sit in at Woolworths. And what they did is they sat in, and over a period of months, ultimately Woolworths had to change their policy. But what was most important is that became a tactic that was used all around the country. And so the notion of sitting in at lunch counters became one of the most important tactics of the civil rights movement that really began um, with, the, with the Greensboro sit-ins. We'll sit in until we can eat in any counter in the United States. And I understand you have a personal connection to this too. When I was a kid growing up in New Jersey, um, I would go shop with my mother and my aunt, and as if, if I was good, they'd let me go to Woolworths, right? And I'd sit down and get a Woolworths hamburger. I thought that was the promised land. And so I'm about seven or eight years old, and my aunt takes me to visit a relative in North Carolina. Um, and so they're slow, and I'm running ahead of them, and I see a Woolworths. So I jump in the Woolworths, I sit down, I'm ready for my hamburger, and these two white hands pick me up, and moved me over to the colored section, which had no seats, and made me stand there. And my aunt comes running in. I couldn't tell why she's all upset. And they ordered me a hamburger, and it didn't taste the same. And I never went to another Woolworths from that moment on. So then, years later, I'm working as a curator at the National Museum of American History, and I hear that the Woolworths is closing. And I thought, I bet we could collect that lunch counter. So ultimately, I went down to Greensboro with a colleague, and we negotiated, and we collected the lunch counter and brought it back to the Smithsonian, where it's now one of the most important artifacts in that museum. Was there a pushback from Woolworth when you decided that you were going to take that moment and kind of chronicle that piece of history? When we talked to Woolworth's headquarters in New York, they were very concerned because they said, that'll make us look bad, um, you know, that we were part of the segregation. And I argued, I said, no, what'll make you look good is that you changed. Is that like much of America, you changed based on the pressure and you did what's right. I asked that question about pushback because in the current time we're in, in these movements, I see so many people, so many white people in this country reluctant to acknowledge our racist past because they think, seem to think, that it's an admonishment on them, that it reflects their values. And I see frustration among people in my generation in this activist movement because they're contending with that. What would you say to folks in my generation who are frustrated with feeling like we have to uh, convince folks that our fight for racial justice isn't a fight against you and your personal identity, but rather uh, an acknowledgement of all of our collective identity as human beings? Whether you think it's the right thing or not, African Americans have always had to educate Americans, other Americans. Um, and so in a way, that's a burden we carry. And my notion is that what is so powerful about the movement right now is that you do see a diversity of people participating, which tells me that maybe we can help people understand this is not just the black moment, this is a quintessential American moment, and that all Americans have a responsibility of participating at this moment. And in order to make a country better, you've got to acknowledge the fact that as much as we talk about liberty and freedom as part of America's heritage, so too is racial violence and systematic discrimination. You know, when we talk about movements, 
I think about momentum. And, you know, like the young people back then at that Greensboro lunch counter, we're impatient. You know, we, we want it now. And I think it's something righteous about being impatient for justice. I think it makes sense. Uh, but also, I think we kind of forget that those sit-ins, that that movement lasted about six months, that the Montgomery bus boycott was 380 plus days or something to that effect. And how did you guys maintain the courage, the determination, the will to keep fighting and keep moving forward? I think what kept the momentum going was a belief, a belief that change was possible, that there were enough little victories where you could say, we desegregated Albany, Georgia, and those gave you a faith that you can keep moving. But candidly, the other thing that really helped was that you had a variety of leaders, not just Martin Luther King, but Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker, and you had all these people who basically um, would challenge those of us that were younger to struggle, but to also have patience. And one of the things I've learned as a historian is one of the great strengths of the African-American community is resiliency is not giving up for the long term. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. I've been thinking deeply about what it takes to create a movement. Usually each movement has a catalyst. In fact, a catalyst literally means, you know, something that helps to provoke change. Uh, and it's hard to predict what a catalyst may be. You know, multiple people have been killed at the hands of police violence, but something about this moment, the pandemic, and the, the murder of George Floyd was the catalyst for today's movement. I always say to people, as a black man, I'm tired of mourning. I'm tired of talking about black people who were shot, who were lynched, or now who need. And I realize that I think that for many people, they no longer see this as a separate entity. They now say, this is me. And I think that sense of personalization is what really makes a catalyst work. And I think that um, the murder of George Floyd was one of those catalysts that people took personally. And it forced people to do something. And what they're doing is something transformative. I remember George Floyd's character was denigrated because they brought up his, his uh, you know, criminal past. And the same thing with, well, why was Trayvon wearing a hoodie? All of these different things. Do you think we'll get past the point of having to be the perfect Negro <laughs> before uh, folks take our movement seriously, even with our, in our own community? I hope so, but it's a burden. Um, I mean, I think if you think of Claudette Colvin, what you see is here is the woman who said, I will sit down because this is right. Um, but the black leadership said, here is a woman that is pregnant um, at 16. Um, that's not the, the, the symbol we want. Whereas Rosa Parks, more educated, stable. She was the symbol that said um, the community, the white community couldn't denigrate her. Even within the movement, uh, you have a lot of conversations happening. And, you know, with leaders like Ella Baker, Diane Nash, they had to contend with sexism as well as racism. What are some of the conversations that have been happening even within the movement as we talk about massage noir and how uh, you know civil rights activists of today have been making sure that we make that, that, that we address these issues of misogyny uh, within the Black Lives Matter movement, within civil rights movements, and the erasure of the impact of LGBTQ folks and women in movements across the civil rights uh, movement. I think that one of the most important things that's happening now is that we've got inclusive leadership um, and that the movements are not in the 60s. Women were so central, but they were subordinate. Um, and so what you now have are women leading these movements, LGBT people being central to this. So in some ways, that inclusiveness means that it's forcing the movement to be as fair as it demands America to be. Yeah, and even thinking about the Black Lives Matter hashtag started by women, some of whom I believe are queer. And a lot of us haven't heard the history of Vair Rustin and his involvement with the March on Washington. Can you briefly let us know about that history so that we can build this thread to know that these conversations were happening about uh, the LGBTQ community within the black community aren't new? Bayard Ruskin, who really was the organizational genius that shaped so much of Martin Luther King's activities, and he was crucial in organizing, planning, and implementing the March on Washington. And yet, he was tried, they tried to keep him under wraps. 
because they were afraid that the FBI would use his homosexuality as a way to say, see, this is a communist-led movement. It's a movement that doesn't have American values. And so instead of being courageous enough to say he is who he is, there was this desire to sort of keep him back so therefore the movement wouldn't suffer. One of the things that's most important to me is for African Americans to lead this, then they've got to basically lead and say, this is the way we expect all people to be treated. Um, and that means we've got to start with ourselves first. Yeah, yeah, no, very beautifully said. Let's talk about the resources at the Smithsonian that are derived from history, but can serve as a guide for how we can move forward. What is important is that I think places like the Smithsonian have to play a role to demonstrate that they're of value and that they are as much about today and tomorrow as they are about yesterday. We have created a major initiative called Race, Community, and Our Shared Future which will allow us to put the resources in, to create the kind of virtual conversations, to do the collecting so that this moment is not lost in history. So that in essence, for me, museums like the Smithsonian have to be part of the struggle to change a country. Otherwise, there are places about nostalgia. And nostalgia is wonderful, but nostalgia never changes a thing.